So 80-year-old man uh, with dyspnea, referred for management of severe tricuspid regurgitation, has progressive dyspnea over six months despite escalating doses of diuretics, currently NYHA class three. Um, past medical history, just chronic atrial fibrillation, um, moderate mitral regurgitation, and then spinal stenosis, chronic back pain, which limited uh, his mobility to a degree. Um, exam, blood pressure, uh, 135 over 82, pulse of 55, um, moderately elevated jugular venous pressure. Uh, with um, the, the liver was reported to be pulsatile. Um, irregular heart rhythm, you see a grade two systolic murmur at the left sternal border, uh, and, and uh, just trace pedal edema was reported. Um, here's the electrocardiogram, again showing uh, irregular atrial fibrillation and a, and a right bundle branch block pattern. Um, now here's the initial images from the echocardiogram, okay, again, um, mitral or sorry, tri tricuspid uh, RV inflow view here. Um, again, pay attention to the, to the leaflets uh, and where they're meeting or not meeting. And again, you see a very broad jet of tricuspid regurge on the right. And um, these are the apical images. And this is Mayo format, so you see the RV on the right. Um, again, if you're not sure, the crux of the heart, you know, the tricuspid uh, septal leaflet is usually more apically displaced, so indeed this is uh, the right ventricle. Huge right atrium, kind of a sliver of pericardial effusion. Um, again, you see this very broad jet of TR. In this case, it's pretty obvious. Sometimes when the TR is wide open like this, if it's laminar flow, actually underestimate the amount of leakage, but, but clearly a lot of tricuspid regurgitation. Um, of course, spectral Doppler is kind of our window into hemodynamics. Um, we see uh, a peak TR velocity of probably about 2.2. Again, this may not necessarily be reflective of pulmonary pressures because of the amount of tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, we can underestimate uh, the, the right ventricular systolic pressure and then very prominent uh, systolic reversals um, in, in the hepatic veins. Um, so I added a question here. Um, so first question, is, and I think this kind of gets at um, uh, how we treat this patient. What is the mechanism of tricuspid regurgitation in this case? Is it uh, A, annular uh, dilatation? Uh, B, tethered tricuspid leaflets. C, uh, restricted leaflet closure. Uh, pacemaker lead uh, impingement, I don't know. Right, let's phone a friend. Yeah, good. So most of you got that uh, right. So what's interesting about, about this uh, topic is oftentimes I think there is overlap. I mean, in, in, I, I think that, to, to me, I still think it's useful to think about the Carpentier classification when we, when we look at the tricuspid valve. And the Carpentier was used originally for, for uh, sort of identifying mitral pathology and, and surgical repair of the mitral valve. But I, it's not a perfect corollary to the tricuspid, but I do think it's still useful. Um, and so this case, the patient was a setup for this. Chronically has a massively dilated right atrium and a, a dilated um, tricuspid annulus. Uh, leaflet mobility is relatively normal, so we don't see severe restriction of the leaflet mobility during systole or diastole, perhaps just mild leaflet tethering. Uh, but, but primarily, this is an, an annular, uh, annular issue, we thought. Uh, and again, this is important as we think about how, how best to uh, repair this valve, in, in particular, uh, if, if we're thinking about a uh, transcatheter, uh, transcatheter strategy. Um, so next question is, what's the next best step? Should we, um, A, evaluate for other causes of dyspnea, the TR looks moderate, uh, B, uh, we could consider cardioversion. Um, the patient's in AFib, and that may be part of the issue. Converting to sinus rhythm could help. Uh, C, consider surgical tricuspid valve repair. Or D, consider transcatheter tricuspid valve repair or placement. You, your, your heart has, you, you know, it's con confined in this pericardium. Your R RV starts dilating. Your LV kind of shrinks down. It can't fill. The wedge pressure goes up, and they get dyspnea. 
We never could figure it out, but I think we're, we're starting to do it. Here's your answer. So this is exactly what we thought too. So, so I mean, this patient actually we thought was was a reasonable candidate for surgical tricuspid valve repair, um, and you see a kind of an even even split there. So the patient was evaluated by an interventional cardiologist and um, an experienced heart surgeon, and was offered surgical repair of the tricuspid regurgitation, uh, which still is the gold standard for for um, repair of tricuspid uh, leakage. Um, the patient expressed a strong desire for a, for a less invasive approach and, and was actually evaluated for one of the clinical trials uh, for transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair and ultimately actually was enrolled um, in in um, edge-to-edge repair trial. Uh, so I, I, I bring up this case in part uh, to, to sort of show you some of the thought process that goes into um, selecting these patients for transcatheter tricuspid repair. Um, and a couple of considerations uh, are, are sort of um, anatomy. So um, there are a couple of features of this echo which concerned us about edge-to-edge -edge repair. Um, and one of them was this big gap. So if you measure the, this is uh, actually Soren did this to you. Uh, Soren, uh, as you can tell, has been very busy uh, clinically. We've done half of the studies up here, it feels like, today. But this, uh, it was an, an, a transesophageal echo image, which is a, the deep esophageal image. So basically what he's done is he's pushed the esophageal transducer deeper into the esophagus, which brings, brings you closer to the tricuspid valve. And if the patient has a good imaging window, we get these high-resolution images of the tricuspid valve. Uh, and what you can see is what we call the septolateral gap. And so this uh, is a this leaflet here adjacent to the to the septum is the septal leaflet. And depending on your depth, uh, this leaflet, which we call the lateral leaflet, it would be either the anterior or the posterior. And, and probably in most cases, if you're pushed deep like this, it's going to be the posterior leaflet. But when we see this septolateral gap at about a centimeter or more, or, or some even say seven millimeters or more, uh, that's concerning and, and maybe a, a, a one uh, risk factor for suboptimal uh, TR reduction. Um, the other thing that we can see in this view, which is, is in this particular patient, is we have a nice long septal leaflet. So some of these patients will have a, a short septal leaflet, and we really need about seven to nine millimeters, depending on the size of the device, we need at least seven to nine millimeters of leaflet length inside that device, or you, you risk the leaflet slipping out and having uh, leaflet detachment. This patient did have a, a fairly long septal leaflet, which was uh, favorable. Um, this is another workhorse view kind of for, for um, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. So now we've pushed, um, I should say Soren has pushed the, the transducer into the uh, stomach. So the transgastric view of the uh, tricuspid valve. And again, what you see is a large gap, uh, basically going all the way anterior up here, all the way to posterior, and a broad jet of TR. And you see this multi-scalloped uh, tricuspid valve and some prominent cords. So this, these were all sort of things that we brought up as were sort of less than optimal uh, for, for edge to edge repair. And here's uh, 3D, again, showing that very large um, septolateral gap and this broad jet uh, of TR. Uh, for reference, this is looking at the tricuspid valve essentially from the right atrium uh, perspective. This would be the atrial septum. This is the septal leaflet here. Uh, this would be kind of a big anterior leaflet, and then the posterior leaflet would back, be back here. And so we, you know, we thought about this case, um, and we thought, are any of these things modifiable? And I think this is something that we're increasingly going to see um, in our practice. Um, our, I feel like our surgeons have known this uh, forever, and I think that we are just starting to realize the importance of this in, in the transcatheter realm also. So the, what, the thing we were most concerned about was that very large gap and whether we could close that gap essentially with a clip or a device. Uh, and so one way to reduce the size of that gap is, is really to diurese the patient given the, the very dynamic uh, nature of TR. So this patient was actually admitted for aggressive IV diuresis um, prior to the procedure really to try to reduce the size of that septal lateral gap. And this was actually one of the first cases where we 
where we did that, and it was a pretty dramatic result, actually. So the patient diuresed multiple liters. Um, I apologize for the, the, for some reason, this one is playing faster than it should. But essentially, the gap is gone. So we took a patient that had basically torrential TR and a gap of more than a centimeter uh, to a patient that had basically severe TR uh, with very little gap. So, so really, the, 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 the biggest concern we had for the procedure was alleviated by, by really optimi optimizing the patient's uh, fluid status. So now, this is a 3D view, again, with, with color where we've um, taken the multiplanar reformatting and we've adjusted the planes to show us what we want. So here's that nice short axis view. We see a big central jet of TR. Um, this is essentially um, that septal lateral view that I showed you. This would be a septal leaflet and a lateral leaflet. And then actually the anterior posterior uh, dimension here. So with 3D, we can really do kind of uh, see these valves in a way that we, we really can't see as well with 2D. And again, just to emphasize that baseline versus, versus post-diuresis, uh, a, a dramatic uh, difference. And so we did decide to, to go forward with um, device uh, placement. So here um, is one way that we're using 3D echo during these procedures. So again, um, by doing live 3D imaging, we can take these planes just like you, you might do with a, a volumetric CT or an MRI and we can actually align the planes to see um, exactly what we want. So here, again, we've, down in the lower left panel is, is essentially a, a simulated short axis. Uh, we're essentially through the annular level here, and you can see our green line uh, is, is, is going through the aortic valve. Uh, and now the aortic valve is our anterior, this is essentially going anterior to posterior. And we see that green box here. So we have a nice anterior posterior dimension. And then on the orthogonal view, uh, this is essentially our septal to lateral dimension. You see a little bit of atrial septum. We're probably a little off axis, but essentially this is our septal to lateral dimension. And so this really facilitates communication. When we're going in with the clip and the interventionalist says, where does it need to go? Where's the trajectory? If the clip is too far this way towards the aortic valve, I can say it's too anterior, you gotta go posterior. Similarly, we speak in terms of septal and lateral. So it's too septal over here, we gotta go lateral. And so this has really facilitated the tricuspid procedures in a way that without live 3D like this, it would be much more difficult uh, to do. And here's an example of, of grasping. So he, now we've crossed the leaflets. With the device, um, you can see we're just into the right ventricle. Um, in our septal lateral dimension, uh, what we can see is, is we've grasped the septal leaflet and the, and the lateral leaflet. Now we, we know it's the anterior leaflet in this case because we look at the short axis. Uh, we go to our transgastric. So we look at our transgastric and we see where is the residual TR? Do we have enough leaflet? In this case, we've kind of pinned that residual TR uh, posterior to the device, which is typically what we want. Because if there's a lot of residual le leakage anterior to the device, it's more difficult to see in these transgastric views because we're shadowed. Uh, so we, we were happy with the grasp. We put the first device in and decided to do a second device uh, again, this is that same anterior posterior dimension. This is the device that's released. We're putting in a second device just posterior to the first, again, to try to address that residual uh, TR. Uh, and, and this is after the devices were released. So this happened to be a, a, just a beautiful result for this patient um, with two clips and just uh, trivial residual TR. And I, I present this case kind of as an example of how you can optimize these patients and potentially get a nice result. Uh, but certainly this is a procedure that uh, we're learning a lot about uh, and, and um, has, uh, I think, a little bit of ways to go as far as um, achieving surgical results, which we are not able to do yet. And I'll show you a little bit of data uh, on that. Um, so I, this is, again, to emphasize how this procedure works. So these are, again, from the 3D volumes. This is a simulated short axis of the tricuspid valve. Again, septal, anterior, lateral, and posterior. And this is the baseline anatomy. So septal lateral dimension at baseline was 4.2. And what's interesting, after these two devices, 
essentially you pull in that septal lateral dimension. So the reason this works is because we're able to somewhat modify that um, that uh, annular dimension with with the edge to edge repair uh, devices. Um, so this particular patient doing well at three months post uh, tricuspid valve uh, edge to edge repair with mild residual TR. Now, I wanted to show you, that was obviously the, the, the ideal result, um, but this procedure is uh, something that, again, we're, we're learning about, and it's not for the faint of heart. It's certainly a number of imaging and technical challenges remain. And this is one of the um, kind of early feasibility uh, studies for this particular, this is the device that I showed you. Uh, it's called the, the CLASP uh, device. And essentially, it has these two paddles, and what, what happens is, the leaflets uh, essentially get pinned uh, in between the paddles and the clasp, and then when you close this whole thing, uh, essentially you, you take those two leaflets um, together, similar to, to what you would imagine with the mitra clip. So when we look at the outcomes in this uh, early feasibility study, it's 34 patients, um, and, and you know 85% had some degree of reduction in TR, right? So at least one grade. Uh, again, not necessarily surgical results, and about 52% had moderate or less TR. So, right, so about half had moderate or, or had um, more than, um, I guess, more than moderate TR. Uh, now, some of these patients, uh, understandably, were starting with torrential TR. Uh, so, so to go from torrential to severe, uh, some of these patients may have actually felt a little, felt a little bit better. But again, just to emphasize uh, uh, and, and to adjust expectations for our patients, this, this is not necessarily achieved surgical reduction in TR uh, as of now. Um, this is another, uh, I think, interesting study in that it's a registry study for patients who underwent uh, kind of off-label use of essentially a mitra clip for, for repair of the tricuspid reg uh, regurgitation, edge-to-edge -edge repair. And what was interesting about this particular group is that um, they actually, uh, I think for this they defined success as moderate or less TR. So again, uh, so moderate or less versus more than moderate residual TR. And there did seem to be a signal for those that had less than, moderate or less TR, I should say, uh, tended to do better as opposed to those who were left when, with more than moderate TR. So to me, there's at least a signal in patients who aren't surgical candidates that even if we can get the, the TR to moderate, uh, potentially these, these patients may benefit uh, to a degree. Um, so again, um, as, as a summary, tricuspid valve repair is investigated uh, really in multiple clinical trials. Um, there's a couple of edge-to-edge trials, and then there's annual, you know, annular reduction strategies, there's replacement trials. So it's a very active area of research. Um, and, and TR reduction is certainly less than open surgery, uh, but there is at least a signal for those who are not surgical candidates. If we're able to get them down to moderate or less, uh, there, there may be a signal of benefit in those patients. Uh, and then I think this case highlights optimizing heart failure and volume status may be important to achieve uh, good results in these patients. Uh, and then we, of course, need better uh, screening criteria and anatomic uh, selection criteria as we try to optimize this procedure.